Salamtana Taina Yesterlin. We'd like to discuss some of our ancestry and some of our ancientcy. And in this particular um in this particular study module, Salamta Taina Slinin Arasia Dinos Tefarin, Wendem Yaden, I'm Wendem Yaden or Ras Iodonis or Yadinos Arasia Dinos Tefari. Call me Wendem, Wendem Yad. What we'd like to discuss right here is a subject matter that's close, near, and dear to our heart, and we've been meditating on it for some years now. And it's the, the gala, the gala, and the gala Ethiopian connection. It's very, very important to know who we are. So when we discuss who we are as the once lost but now found Beta Israel and who we are as Ethiopians and as Ethiopian Hebrews, it's very important for us to make the connection, some of the obvious connections that's been staring us right in the face for a while. And this is something that I've been meditating on for some years now. And I have a couple of notes that I'd like to share to share with you. Are you able to, hopefully you're able to see this pretty well. Um, we'll zoom in if, uh, if necessary. So now the, the Gala and the Gala connection. What is the Gala and the Gala connection? Who are the Galas and who are the Gullas? And is there any connection between these two peoples? Now, see, we're going to discuss this from our own African American perspective based on what we know of ourselves. And we recognize that there are many um, so called Ethiopians or Africans who, because of a lack of knowledge of who they are, really, will disagree with our overstanding of and coming to a full standing of who we are. And this has been something that we've been. Um, <clears throat> something that we've been encountering often, and many of you might have encountered this with certain so-called Ethiopians or certain so-called Africans. And there's this, um, there's this, I wouldn't say it's an old saying, but it's almost like an old saying that, well, you know, Africans so-called don't recognize us as Africans. Well, African is just a general Eurocentric kind of a terminology and there's a lot of misunderstanding that's associated with that. So we use African in a very limited sense. If we would know who we are, we have to study and to show ourselves to prove. We have to study it for ourselves, and we have to prove it for ourselves and to ourselves. This is what's important, especially as diaspora, especially as a set of people who were literally um, bought and sold and whose identity was stripped from them. And if you want more details or reference about what we're speaking about, how to make a slave or the Wooly Lynch papers, we'll discuss more. But the Gala and the Gullah, what is the Gala and the, the Gullah connection? If you look up the Wikipedia, you'll find some interesting, um, some interesting, some facts, some assumptions, some speculations. But we're going to try to just address the facts. So here, let's Let's put this up here. Mm -hmm. Here we have Gala. Gala. What is Gala? Now, Gala, if you would look it up on the Internet or if you look it up in some um, historical books, and it's a pejorative now. In other words, Gala is like the N-word. Like the N-word is for African Americans and has become generally for African Americans. The word gala also is a pejorative. But the real root of gala, as we found, comes from the Arabic. And my Arabic is a little bit uh, rusty right here. But this is gal. This is gal. Or you could either write it G-A-L, but really it's a Q. A L and 
gal or al, gal or al, in Arabic means to say. And then you have, um, <coughs> you have la, la equals la, and la like in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew we have lo, and lo or la in the Arabic and Hebrew, it means no. So this means to say no, say no, to say no. The real root of this word gala is not Amharic or Ethiopic, even though Ethiopians and many Amharas um, should be blamed for using this terminology as a pejorative or as a, as a derisive or insult. So today, many galas or many people who are related to this don't call themselves Gala anymore. We're speaking about in the East and in Ethiopia and that region. Instead, they call themselves Oromo. They call themselves the Oromo people. The Oromo people. And there's a big campaign and different campaigns associated with the Oromo people. Now, let's get back to this root right here of Gala because we need to put this in perspective with the Gullah, with the Gullah people. Now, the Gullah people. Let's look this up right here. The Gullah people, according to the Wikipedia, and we're going to use that as a general, as a general reference point, and then we'll go into some uh, critical analysis of what's being said and whether it's, you know, weigh and balance it for ourselves. Now, the Gullah, or the Gullah, rather, the Gullah, and this little um, vowel, um, syllabolic change between the ga and the ga, as we explained right here from the Arabic, we have gal and we have la. We have gal la, gal la, gal la or gala, which means to say, say no, to say no, because the gala people were called this, mainly this term came into great use in ancient times in what's known as Ethiopia today, but what was called Abyssinia, by the so-called Ottoman, let's see if we can put this here, the Ottoman, the Ottoman Turks, the Ottoman Turks, and they came with what's known as Mohammedism, or Mohammedism, or a version of Islam, and the Oromo people, who are known today as Oromo people, and the ancestors of the Gullah people, they gala, they said no. They said no to Mohammedanism and to Islam. And therefore they were labeled as the Gala people. Now there's two different directions which the Gala people um, took in this particular time. And we're talking um, prior to, um, let's say, um, between the time of Islam, after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, um, peace be upon him, for all those who are of that, we don't want to unnecessarily offend, um, <clears throat> sometime roughly, let's say, around the 1000s, when the generally, when the Crusades began, 1000s or 1100s. So we have a period of time between the 1000s, the 1100s, historically speaking, and say 1530. 1530, make a note of 1530. 1530 is very important. But now here, the Gullah people, and now how are the Gullah people defined? And we go, we're first of all making an etymological link between the Gala and the Gullah. Because also in Arabic, if you say Gul, 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 it means also to say, to say gul. You'll find this in the Quran. You'll find this in, in classical Arabic or Arabia Fusha. You'll find that to say gul or gal, gal, gul. It depends on also the dialect and the speaker of Arabic. But what is primary is the basic sound. So the first part, gal, gal, gul, la, la. Minor differences, you understand, but the sound, as we say as Rastafari, um, first of all, pick sense out of nonsense. 
and word, sound, and power. What is the word? What does the word mean? What is it referenced to? What is the sound of the word? And the power to say, in this context, is the interpretation. What is the targum? The targum. What's the translation or interpretation of the word? Now, gullah are defined as, and according to this right here, the gullah are defined as African Americans who live in the low country region of South Carolina and Georgia, which includes both the coastal plain and the sea islands. Historically, the Gullah region once extended north to the Cape Fear area on the coast of North Carolina and south to the vicinity of Jacksonville on the coast of Florida. But today, the Gullah area is confined to the South Carolina and Georgia Low Country. The Gullah people and their language are also called Geechee. There's also known as the Geechee. So some will say, oh, the Gullah people? You mean the Geechee people. You understand? Which some scholars speculate is related to the Ogeechee River near Savannah, Georgia. The term Geechee is an, what they call an emic term used by speakers and can have a derogatory connotation depending on usage. Now, this is interesting because with both the people in the East, right, the Gala people, and the people in the West, the Gala people, or the African Americans who identify themselves as Gala people, their names and names associated with them are also associated with. Uh, by outsiders, namely, with a derogatory, with a negative or pejorative usage. Now, we'll find that these are bywords. The Bible describes that the Beta Israel, or the true Hebrews, the true ethnic Hebrews, would be known by a byword and bywords. They'd be known as other names or by other names in a derogatory sense to point to spiritually the curse for disobedience and the loss of identity and the loss of the covenant and the loss of, we could say, God's blessing. It was the fulfillment of Deuteronomy chapter 28. Now, as we go further, when they say that, uh, that Gullah now is a term that was generally used by outsiders, but that has become a way for speakers to formally identify themselves and their language. Now, the, the next very interesting thing that we have and we find between the Gala and the Gala, in the words East, the Gala, or nowadays known as the Ormals, you understand, and the Gullah people, who are also nowadays known more generally as African Americans or even called Geechee people, you understand, the, the, the interesting thing you will find is that there was a term labeled them and eventually they accepted, or, or, or rather, they identified with this labeling, both in the case of the old-time Gala people of the East, today they're known as Ormo. We want to stress that because many Ormo people take uh, great offense at the use of Gala, you understand? And there is great anger and animosity to, to other Ethiopians, you understand, because of this, um, we can say, prejudice, bias, uh, hardship, uh, other things real, and some, um, we would say imagined, but some greatly exaggerated. But be that as it may, what we are seeking to do is make this Ethiopian connection between the Gala people of the East and the Gullah people of the West, or those who went into cap the captivities, and then get to the root of this very Word. What's the root of this word? Now, one particular um, interpretation of where this word, namely Gala, comes from is based on the Ottoman Turks who were Mohammedan. You understand? They were Mohammedan or so called Islamicists. They were Islamicists. And when they met this black African Ethiopian tribe of people, you understand, who today are known as the Ormo, in that day they were called the Gala because they said, say no. They said no. They said no to Islamism. And many of these Gala people, or Oromo people, 
Yofin join the side of the Tigra and Hara, the covenant keepers, or what we call the Ethiopian Shemites or Semites, what we can call the Judeo-Christian, the Solomonic, that Solomonic core, the African Zion. They joined the Judeo-Christian people. They became, we can say, Ethiopian Amhara of the Amhara of Sultane. Not really a tribe, but they became part of this. It's like in the West when somebody becomes um, American, in a sense. You understand? They become part of this identity, part of this, um, for lack of a better word, civilization. You understand? It's like when people in the West identify with Greco-Roman culture, you understand, and in school that's known as the classics, and there's, they, they belong to, say, a certain church, they speak a certain language, they adopt certain customs and mores that makes them in the, that society sense a citizen, you understand, so when we speak about the Amhara Tigray, Amhara, the Amhara Sultane, we're not speaking about it in the in the um, misunderstood sense today as a, quote, tribe in that sense, but we're speaking about it in its proper context as a sultane representing the Judeo-Christian Kal Kidan or the covenant, the covenant keepers, we can say, the African Zion, the African Zion. But a portion of these Oromo or Gala people, you understand, did adopt the... Ottoman Turkish um, brand of Islamism. You understand? Some, actually, some Ethiopians had adopted Islam from the time of the Hijra. You understand? When the Prophet Muhammad had sent his uh, Sahaba or his companions for refuge into Ethiopia, into the Nagashi. You understand? And they're called the Jabarti. They're called the Jabarti people, which is a, a different, a different um, people. Uh, a, a different um, culture, we can say, as well. And there's a different, there's differences of relationship. This is why we have to know who we are as a people and also know who the other peoples are. And this is very important, especially in this 45th um, Torah portion reading that's known as Va'et Hanan in the Hebrew and as Lamenuhu, which discusses the conquest of the Canaan, the conquest of the Promised Land, seeing what particular um, dispensation we are in presently as the one source, but now found data is Israel. Now, another important link, and what we're doing right here is we are not getting into all of the details because it's very interesting details, but we are pointing out certain details. We're seeking to point out certain important details, namely the etymology the etymological link between these two. Like we said, one is the people of the East, today known as the Ormo. The next is the people of the West, those who went into the captivities, known as the Gullah people, who maintained a certain, a certain identity, a certain even language. Now, the language, somewhat one would say, well, some aspects of the language are more maybe West African. We have to also understand what occurred in about a 500, you understand, a 500 to roughly 1,000 year, a millennia period of time between roughly 1100 or after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, you understand, the rise of the Ottoman Turks, you understand, the battles in the Horn of Africa, because all of this shapes, gives a background shape to the present geopolitical situation in the Horn of Africa. And today you might know about the Horn of Africa or hear Ethiopia in the news or Somalia in the news or that particular region in the news like Darfur and wonder what are these battles about? What's all this fighting about? Aren't they all African? Aren't they all black people? Why are black people fighting each other? And that demonstrates some ignorance you understand, of the one who asked that question, because if you understood the background story or their history, you know what I'm saying, then you would understand why these um, conflicts have basically um, followed, you understand, the particular peoples even into the present time. 
and we will also understand in the knowledge of ourself the important role that we as the once lost but now found Beta Israel have in world peace. You see, we have a very important role in world peace, but we cannot fulfill that role without the knowledge of who we are as the once lost but now found Beta Israel or Ethiopian Hebrews. And it's important for us to remember as Ethiopian Hebrews, there are 12 tribes and there are families, different families. Now today, when you look at Ethiopia or Africa, they will say these are different tribes. You understand? So we have the Eurocentric, the Anglo-American um, um, perspective or, or whitewash distortions. We have a lot of their speculations and some of their divide et impira, in other words, divide and conquer as well. We see this clearly in Ethiopia today, you understand, particularly in Ethiopia post-imperial um, Ethiopia. We see this divide and conquer between the, the, the formerly known Gala, the Oromos, the Amharas, and even the Tigrais, and, and other tribes with the Horn of Africa, with the insurgents or the Islamo-fascists, the Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab organization, what's going on with the drought situation. And what many of us don't understand is the history of the peoples or of the region. And it's very important for us to be educated about that, both the knowledge of ourselves vis-a-vis the other people of the region. Now, what we found to be particularly interesting, you understand, because what we found particularly interesting is when it spoke about the Gullah are known for preserving more of their African linguistic and cultural heritage than any other African-American community in the United States. This is interesting, that the Gullah were able to preserve more of this. Why? Because they have maintained something that links them, you understand, links them to where they are truly from and who they are truly. In other words, that links them to not just Africa, but to Ethiopia. But here's what the, um, the experts say. The experts say that they speak an English-based Creole language containing many African loan words and significant influence, influences from African languages in grammar and sentence structure. The Gullah language is related, they say, to Jamaican Creole, to Barbadian dialect, Bahamian dialect, and Creole language of Sierra Leone in West Africa. Gullah storytelling, cuisine, music, uh, folk beliefs, crafts, farming, and fishing traditions all exhibit strong influences from West and Central African cultures. So um, the, the academics and, and, and the scholars, they want to trace it, and they're tracing it properly, but they want to stop it at Central African culture. See, what we have to remember about the slave trade is that although the, the, the ports, the marketplace, was in the west, you know, on the western coast, and remember that region, the waters was not known as the Atlantic or Southern Atlantic, but it was known as the Ethiopic Ocean. You understand, the white man came along and want to call it like, 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 like a Negro land, you understand, in order to ignore the true um, um, history uh, identities of the various people so they could spin their own story. So what we're going through is this spin of our story, you understand, and getting to our root, that when the Mohammedans, namely the Ottoman Turks, and, and Ottoman Turks were also responsible for this uh, pseudonym, you understand, of Abyssinia. Abyssinia is a pseudonym, you understand, and Habashistan, a pseudonym that the Mohammedan Ottoman Turks you know, saying, in seeking to conquer that whole region, you know, saying, brought, and they only got as far as the coast, but still their influence, still their effect, and the defect that it had to the covenant keepers and to the stability of that land is still felt even today. Behind al-Shabaab, behind the so-called African-Arab identity versus the African-Black identity or the Bantuism and all these this kind of, um, like in Sudan, for example, where the people in the north consider themselves Harab or Arab. 
and the people in the South consider themselves African or Nubian. The people in the North are Mohammedan. The people in the South are Christian. Now, when you look in Ethiopia, Ethiopia is mainly has a Christian, Judeo-Christian heritage. You understand? But the people of the Horn, such as Somalia and such as certain parts of the North and certain parts of Eritrea, are, have been heavily influenced by the Mohammedanism or the Islamofascism, but we need to go back in history to understand the Ottoman Turks and the Osmali, you understand? And from the Osmali came the Somali, you understand? This identity, you understand, is not really native to the people, you understand, but was actually imposed upon the people by war and religion. Now, when the, the Oromo people said no to Islamism, you understand, and many of them became Ethiopian Christian, and others did not become Ethiopian Christian. Some just kept their own tribal religion, their own um, um, indigenous belief system. They were called the Gala, the Gala, those who said no, chiefly because they said no to Mohammedanism, but then as a reverse for the Ethiopian Christians and many of the Ormos who had become Amhara, you understand, part of that sultane, part of that culture, part of that civilization, part of that, they became citizens of this Al-Kidan, this B'nai Barit, this Ethiopian Zion identity, this Ethiopian Christian, Judeo-Christian identity, you understand, which Solomon, the Queen of Sheba, and that whole lineage represents. Those are some of the major themes represented, but there's more, actually, there's more to it. So now, and going a little bit further, we went to the history section, and this is what we found to be particularly interesting concerning the Gullah. I, I hope you're getting this down because we're going to take this off. I want you to make sure you collect um, good notes on this because we're going to go into much more details um, about this and also to put more of this into writing. We have it in writing, but to compile it, put it together in certain um, booklets and pamphlets where ones and even on the internet to post it on our site. We haven't updated it just yet, but we are going to because the gala and the gala connection is very significant and it's been staring us in the face. You understand? And there are naysayers, no doubt. There'll be naysayers. But what we want the naysayers to do is to present their nays, to say gala, to say no. You understand? And, and tell us why they are saying no. Because we can utilize that since we're confident in the truth. We can utilize that as also object lessons for those of you who are learning and growing and studying with I and I. Now, the name Gullah, according to this Wikipedia page, Gullah may, they say, derive from Angola. Now, this is something very interesting from Angola. I want you to keep that in mind, Angola. And to look at a map and look on a map where Angola is. You understand? Know Where's Angola vis a vis Ethiopia? and vis-a-vis -vis other, other African and Hebraic peoples, you understand, um, where some Gullah people may have originated, may have, so they, they're, 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 they're leading us to south and, and east, southeastern portion of Africa. You understand? They, they led us to the West with the language and the culture and the custom. They led us to Central Africa. Now they've taken a detour a little bit and gone a little bit south. But that's okay. Angola also figures, figures in this picture, you understand, as we will hope to demonstrate soon. It says, some scholars have also suggested it comes from Gola, Gola, or from G-O-L-A, Gola, almost like Cola, Gola right? Gola, an ethnic group living in the border area between Sierra Leone and Liberia in West Africa, another region where many Gullah's ancestors originated, no doubt. Because remember what the Bible says about the base of Israel? They said from one people to another nation, you understand, from nation to nation, from people to people, you understand, that we would, in a sense, be wanderers. And our history as Hebrews demonstrates that after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., according to even Flavius Josephus, many Hebrews 
fled into Africa. The Yorubas have a tradition that says that they actually came from Jerusalem. Their ancestors came from Jerusalem. The Ebo also have a Hebraic tradition. Various different Africans, we know about the Lemba people, and of course the Ethiopian, the so-called Falasha, the Beta Israel. Also there's the Falasha Mura, you understand the Falasha Am. Hara and many Amharas, since it's not a tribe, so to speak, but a Sultana. If we look into the Amharic language, there's a lot of Ordomo and so called Gala influences you know, in the very languages. We can see this, this Hamo Semitic or this Kamo Shemitic blending you know, understand, between the so called um, Hamite and the so called Shemite. But let's not get caught up on, on these terminologies from the whitewash yeah, and the Anglo-European perspective because there's a reason that they coined these terminologies and that reason is David et Impira because they knew and it's been working for them so far pretty well. But the gig is up, the game is over, the, the farce, you understand, has come to conclusion because we're in a new day. You know, saying changes, we changes all over the place, and the major change, you know, saying is ones are going from a lack of knowledge of who they are and coming into gradually, step by step, into the knowledge of themselves, um, the half of their story, in other words. Now, the name Geechee, another common name for the Gullah people, some say may come from the um, the Kissi the Kissi, an ethnic group living in the border area between Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia. See, they're trying to actually keep us to the West Africa because once we can make this connection between the Gala and the Gullah people, you understand, know the so-called African-Americans, you understand, know or the Ethiopian Hebrews, the Ethiopians, black people in America with our Ethiopian and Hebrew people on the Horn of Africa, then the Middle East situation, you understand, will dramatically change. We're already seeing some of these changes because of the World Wide Web, one's information is going to and fro, you understand, and people are getting to know things that have been suppressed for, for, for generations, for centuries, for centuries if not millennia as well. Now, some scholars, and the last part of this that we're going to share right here, is that some scholars have also suggested that Native American origins for these words. Some scholars actually say there's some Native American origins. Spanish called the South Carolina and Georgia coast region the Guale, the Guale. Now we have to remember the role that the Spanish and the Portuguese, the Portuguese also had all over Africa, but particularly in East Africa and particularly with Ethiopia. Um, and then later on, they would come around the, 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 the Cape of Good Hope, and then they would get entangled in certain um, affairs in West Africa. Um, so the Spanish have a name for South Carolina, the South Carolina and Georgia coast region as the Guale, after a Native American tribe. They said after a particular Native American tribe. Now, this is kind of a little bit dubious because there are some black people, Ethiopian people, um, enslaved, you understand, who were able to maintain their freedom, you understand, by living among uh, Native Americans, you understand, and many of the historical documentation basically shows the presence of the black Indian or the black Native American Indian. So we must put that into context when we look at these references. Now, the Ogeechee River is a prominent geographical feature in coastal Georgia, and it takes its name from a Creek Indian, a Creek Indian word. Now, that's just to show some of our history on this side. But what is clear, and I think that this should be clear and clearer after this brief demonstration we have right here. There's another part that we'd like to put up here. But try to take this down right here because it's very important for us to understand what is, what is the Ethiopian or the Ethiopic connection between the people once known as the Gala people and today known as the Oromo people in the East and the Gullah, you know, saying, or the so-called African-American people or the enslaved Beta Israel in the West, the roots, the origins, as well as to the resonance that it has 
to the present day and time. So more to come on this. Stay tuned.